What is happening to it? Defending against the modern day downgrade as we head downhill at breakneck speed. Speaking truth, exposing the lies. This is Polemics Reports. You know why you do it. You don't do it because you get paid well. You don't do it because men love you. You do it because you love men and because more than that, you want to honor God. From a location somewhere in the eastern Montana prairie, this is your host, J.D. Hall. Hello, and you're listening to Polemics Report. Thank you so much for listening in. This is the program that we hope will be glorifying to God, convicting to sinners and edifying to the saints. This is a program with sincere questions and biblical answers. Thank you so much for listening in. There is a chance, though, that if you're listening to this program or if you're listening to this video, it's not the whole program. There's a reason for that. Uh, My co-host and producer, David, and I are going to be putting our program into more bite-sized chunks on YouTube for people to digest a little bit easier than an hour-long program, but we have a commitment. We share the gospel in every single program and in every single program encourage people to be active, giving, loving, participatory members in their biblical New Testament church. So part of this, the gospel portion is going to be cut out and you might be listening to it for the first time and we're going to link it in every single video that we do so that even if it's not about the gospel, you're still getting this if you're not listening to the full program. What's what's the gospel? Starts with the bad news. There's nothing that you can do of your own accord to save yourself. And believe me, you need to be saved. The reason for that is, well, Romans chapter 6 verse 23 tells us the wages of sin is death. God requires death. He he requires a ransom to be paid because of the debt that we've incurred against him. Biblical justice revolves around the principle of restitution. And every time we sin, we rebel against God and we incur a debt. How can we then pay for that debt? Well, hell exists, but it's eternal because no matter how long we're there, when you sin against an infinitely righteous God, there is an infinite amount of punishment to pay for it. So how can we pay for that debt when we ourselves are sinners? Even if we stopped sinning right now, we would still have all the sins that we've already incurred against God, all the debt that already exists. We're in hot water, in other words. But the good news is God is not only holy and righteous and just, but God is also the justifier of those who believe in him. What I mean by that is just as God doesn't overlook sin, he doesn't give it a pass. He'll never say, ah, you tried hard. That's not the type of God we have. We have a just one. We also have a gracious God. And in his graciousness, he sent his son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ, into the world to be conceived of the Holy Ghost, to be brought about in a way slightly differently than you and I, not born with original sin, conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of a virgin, and then he lived a life we should have lived. He lived a life that our father Adam should have lived in complete and perfect obedience before God, earning total righteousness by his active and passive obedience in his life. He earned that vicariously in the place, in the stead of sinners who could not live out that life perfectly. Then he went to the cross, and by God's predestined plan through the hands of sinful men, the Son of God, who was both all God and all man, as he was nailed there, he was imputed with the sin of everyone who would believe in him. Every rotten deed you've done, every transgression of God's law, every piece of iniquity, every bit of transgression, every ounce of sin, guilt, and shame placed upon the bodily back of the Son of God. God the Father then turned his face away from him, shunned his own Son, bringing upon him more spiritual condemnation than we could ever imagine, I think even eclipsing the physical pain of the cross. And he was struck down in the place of sinners, propitiating in himself. That means quenching the wrath of God's righteous anger. And God took out that wrath on sin committed by sinners upon the only one who was sinless. The scripture says, he who had no sin became sin on our behalf so that we could become the righteousness of God. Christ Jesus bore that wrath in his body, just like he bore our sin. He died proving his death was real. He was buried and then proving that his deity was real and his sacrifice was accepted. He rose again from the dead on the third day. 
He is now the heir of all things. He is the judge of the quick and the dead, and he is returning to retrieve his church. If you believe that good news, that you can be saved not by what you've done, but by what someone else has done, that you don't have to take your punishment because someone else took your punishment, his name is Jesus, so that you can take his reward, which is a relationship with God the Father and everything else that it entails, then repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That is an ordinance of the church implicitly commanding us to be active, giving, loving, participatory members in a biblical New Testament church. And we always want to point that out as well at the beginning of the podcast. Discernment, polemics, the field of theology that we specialize in, this is for Christians. It's not used to beat the church. It's used to protect the church. And so we want you to, as Hebrews tells us, train the powers of our discernment with constant practice so that we might be skilled in the word of righteousness. And so we would encourage you to find a biblical New Testament church that will teach you the gospel and all of God's law, as Paul says in Acts 17, did not shrink from teaching the full counsel of God's word. Find that place, join them be a part of them and be a loving, giving, participatory, healthy member in that biblical New Testament church. If you want to find out more about that, email me, jd at pulpitandpen.org. By the way, this program is brought to you by our patron supporters. Big tech doesn't like us. There was a day and time when we could remain financially solvent by the million or so people that read our blogs every single month. That's changed since the big tech duopoly took over. So now Protestia, Pulpit, and Pen and Polemics Report are all ad-free. It's brought to you by people who believe in the mission of polemics. Not a lot of people out there doing it these days. It comes across as negative, mostly because it is. But for $5.95 a month, you can get full access to this program, the whole kit and caboodle, not just half of it, but the whole thing. If you're listening on an RSS feed, Unlike your Patreon app, you're only getting part of it. You also automatically get subscribed to the Insurgency, 50 banned news links that are really hard to get anywhere else, sent directly to your email. You want to open the email and see the news links? You want to read the news? It's as simple as that. If you want to ignore it, ignore it and look at it the next day. It will come to you instead of you having to go scour it. And that way you have more time to spend with your family, your kids, to enjoy your life. That's, by the way, a $7 a month value. That's what we charge for it. But for only $5.95 a month, you get that too. For $34.95 a month, get anything you want from the Reform Gear store. For only $19.95 a month, join yours truly for a study on ecclesiology. Right now, we're in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. For $49.95 a month, get a book sent to you in the mail. Every single month that I pick out, this one is A.D. Robles' book on Pharisees and social justice. And today's program is a little bit different because only in the second half will we be talking about current events. I was recently... Uh, what's the right word? Interviewed, I suppose. I had a conversation on a podcast called Conversations That Matter and hosted by John Harris. And the comments have been glowing. Uh, people are very thankful that he had me on in the same way that we had on Rod Martin. We may not see everything eye to eye. Now, I don't know that I've ever criticized Rod Martin or John Harris, to be honest with you. I haven't found a reason to really. But uh, so it's not as though we were at odds, but people were happy to say, it's nice to see brothers getting together. However, there were some contrarians on YouTube who would say, you need to repent. You need to repent for slandering James White. And I get this about every day in a comment somewhere. And I have to say, okay, define slander. What do you mean by slander? Or I lied about James White. What do you mean lied? What specifically are you talking to? And then we have to get into the details of it. I'm tired of doing that. So I told David, I'm just going to do an episode about James White and why he hates my guts and why I do not hate him back, but why he's been wrong sometimes. And we're going to go through it quickly. And that way you can do the research for yourself. So you stop calling someone a slanderer just for saying things about people that you happen to like. That's what mostly this program is going to be about. And then in the second half of the program, by the way, let me introduce uh, David Morrill from Denver, Colorado, producer and co-host. How are you doing, David? Good. What are we going to talk about when we're done with James White? So there, there are a couple of other things, people, folks that have asked questions the last few days. Uh, one, and I think, I'm not sure if this was a question or if you just wanted to talk about it, but the, the now often quoted 
uh, J.D. Greer and Ed Litton, I guess they both had said this, that uh, that they know that homosexuality doesn't send you to hell because heterosexuality doesn't send you to heaven. As if that wasn't stupid enough on Which is the a surface, theologically, theologically abysmal statement. And then yes. we have questions from patrons, right? That we're going to get yeah, to. Yeah, well, and there was, there was one. Um, I'm not sure if we have questions in the, uh, in the in Patreon right now, but there was a question about... Uh, head coverings in church and exactly what that meant and what it means uh, today. So we'll get to that as well. I had and to then, have that conversation with my daughter the other day, actually, <laughs> who was reading, you know, her text, her scripture. She's a devout believer and was like, why aren't we covering our heads? So we will be talking about that probably in the patron portion. Um, David, on a scale from one to 10, how excited are you that we are making this program in part about James White? On a scale of 10 being, I'm really excited. One being, uh, I, I wish that I was having my teeth pulled by a dentist right now. Wait, one is teeth pulled and 10 is like super uh, excited? Yeah, know. Super Bowl. Super like, Bowl excited. Yeah, like maybe seven or eight or something because, you know, I'm, I'm not... I, I haven't followed the his, you know, history of the spats and things between you guys. So it's. I thought you were going to say I one or two because I thought you were pushing. Where does riding a bike back. ten miles while listening to <laughs> Greek manuscripts on one and a half speed fall? Where does that fall? Joining the program also is <laughs> Seth Dunn, who I asked him to join. You will know him by his terrible audio quality <laughs> and his horrible posture. Not that mine is that much better. And and but the I fact asked that, him. Uh, I. I asked him to join us for one specific reason that you'll find out short shortly. Well, and 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 the fact that every time he writes something, he, he posts it at pulpandpen.org, and sort of pretends like Protestia doesn't exist. I have no, I don't <laughs> know why. I've never asked him why. He's just a stubborn creature who insists on using pulpit and pen, even though pulpit and pen is mostly just a depository for these programs. But I think he's, I think he, Seth's like me. And then I, I tell my children, you know what? I'm Like when I embarrass my daughter, because like when we're at Target and I'm like, how many of those gay t-shirts did you sell? <laughs> and, the, and, and they're like, none. And I'm like, why don't you have any Father's Day t-shirts? <laughs> I'm like, why don't you know your customers better? I tell my daughter, who she's not mortified. She, she knows me. That's what happens when you hang out with dad. I said, I, I'm too young to care and I'm too old to change. And so that's, I think that's Seth. I think he's too young to care and he's just too old to change is, and we're about the same age. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. David, I thought you were going to say one or two because I felt a little pushback when you're like, did James White do something to you recently? <laughs> no, I he's just, not done know, I, something I to, to me recently. I try to follow pretty closely and I, and I, and I thought I'd missed something. No, but I'm sick and tired of James White's fans who cannot think for themselves bringing up matters from seven uh, or excuse me from three four or five years ago that time has judged between us time has judged the matter and i'll be darned if i'm called the liar or a slanderer when time has judged us to be correct in fact i have poked james white like a you know I've poked at him recently and he's chosen not to respond ever since Seth's done Seth Dunn's article at uh, about apologia, which is why he's here, but we're going to go through these articles real quickly. And every single time a James white fan says, you know, you're okay. You have some okay things to say, but you need to repent for what you said about James white. Um, I'm just going to point them to this podcast and be like, this is, this is what I have to say about it. De just deal with it one way or another. By the way, let me start by saying, I listened to everything that man had to say. I cut my teeth on po in polemics on James White and Chris Roseborough and Todd Friel. I listened to everything James White had to say, episode after episode after episode, being bored out of my mind nine times out of 10. I listened to what he had to say. I listened to the bike riding experiences and how, how hot it is in Phoenix and how boring the services are at the Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church. I listened to all that because I valued what the man had to say. I almost fell asleep there two months ago, but it was not his fault. I stayed up too late. Uh, you visited Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church recently, Seth? I, I, I did. My brother lives in Phoenix, and I went to visit him, and uh, I needed a church to go to, and that, that church was just a couple of miles from his house. So I went there did for you find any pulpit? Did you find services. any pulpit? Did you find any pulpit and pen fans? I did. In fact, my brother made fun of me the night before when I said that I was a prominent 
Baptist blogger, him and his Methodist seminarian friend laughed at me. And then I disappeared Sunday morning. He goes, would you find a revival? I'm like, well, no, I found a pulpit and pen fan. Yeah. At Phoenix yes. Reformed Baptist church. Uh, yes, I did. Yeah. Well, great. I hope that. And when we say fans, we mean readers. I'm sure you don't, you're like me. I don't, you don't care to have fans enough with that uh, nonsense, but I'm just going to point people to this podcast and say, here's what I have to say about James White. So let's talk about the arguments that we've had with James White over the years. And this, this is taking my time tonight to save me time in the future. David, I sent these to you via telegram, cue them up. Let's talk about the times that I've disagreed with James White. So this is a uh, pulpit and pen article from September 25th of 2015. Actually, Actually, let me back up just a little bit, David. Okay. Show the photo that I sent you. I sent you a couple photos, I think. You sent me photos? I sent oh, you no. at least one photo. Oh yeah. Yeah. Let me let me let me this is a good one. I this this is this had to be just a uh a little little while ago, I would think. Let me see if I can get this pulled up real quick. How fast can I move? Take your time. Yeah. Yeah, this is de just dead air. Yeah. Yeah. Might jump in this later, but here we go. Yeah. This is when James and I were still getting along. So That's you got me, you got the James Jordan White, James Phil and Johnson. Phil and Chris, huh? Yeah. The four horsemen of the <laughs> polemics apocalypse right there. And there are lots of other photos of James White with my young daughter, James White with my wife, these men all out to dinner with one another. So the first time I criticized James White was not easy for me to do. I maintain a relationship with Phil. I maintain, a, a, I think, a good relationship with Phil. I maintain a good relationship with Chris Roseboro. I've been able to maintain those relationships with James White, not so much. And so let's get to the first disagreement. I just show the vid show the photo to say, this is not like me trying to get back at an enemy. This is me who I've tried to correct a brother who has not yet received criticism that I know of ever in his life. And, and his fans can just deal with it. So, so this is a 20, uh, 2015 fall of 2015 article at, uh, pro, uh, at pulpit and pen Pope calls Jesus, the cross, a failure. Okay. You can look up for the article for yourself. This is one of our first disagreements. The Pope called the cross a failure. There was an expression back in the day, you know, um, a rhetorical one in which someone would say, um, is this, is such and such true? And you would say, does a bear crap in the woods? And it's an, it, it was an obviously like, that means yes. And another expression was, is the Pope Catholic? And this was back when we thought that the Pope was Catholic. Since we came out with this article, 500 different cardinals and, and uh, Catholic church officials, including Michael Fishborn and the folks at Church Militant and Lepanto Institute, have now made the accusation that the Pope, in fact, is not Catholic. And some have suggested that he's not even a believer. This was back before most people recognized that the Pope was a Marxist. I sat down with a very prominent politician in Montana a few weeks ago who I asked him, I said, what's your opinion of Pope Francis? And he said, Pope Francis is a, is a communist and he's not a Christian. And at which point I'm like, why are you a Catholic, dude? And he's like, well, there's more to being a Catholic than recognizing the authority of the Pope. So I hope to be able to convince him of sola fide and have his soul saved. But this was before a lot of those facts came out. But the Pope called the cross a failure and James White claimed on the program, this was the first shot fired, so far as I know, that we were just taking his words out of context. Now, James White has a habit of this. It doesn't matter who the individual is who's doing the work of apologetics or polemics. James White will correct them on his program, on the dividing line, and explain how he can do it better. The first time I heard him do this was with William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig was in a debate on theism. And he critiqued William Lane Craig the whole time. By the way, I'm not a fan of William Lane Craig. But I think William Lane Craig is better at what he does than what James does. James White is much, 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 much closer to what I think theological truth is than William Lane Craig. But my point is he has a tendency to always want to be the guy in the room correcting other people. I realize 
my lack of self-awareness. And that's the accusation people would have towards me. I don't know why James White felt the need to go out of his way to defend the freaking Pope of Rome, but he did. And he attacked our journalism. Please show the next video or screenshot. This is December. A few months later, the Pope says it again. The Pope says it again. So James White said, no, no, no. You took him out of context. That's not how he meant it. Here he said it in a completely different context. And then if you understand that the Pope is a Jesuit and into liberation theology, they absolutely see the cross as a failure because Jesus is identifying with the failures of the world, the oppressed, and the Pope is a liberation theologian from the Jesuit school. If you knew your theology well enough, you would have known James White that when the Pope says the cross is a failure, he means it because he doesn't even have, not only does he not have the real gospel because he's a Romanist, he doesn't even have the Catholic gospel. This is a liberation theology version of Roman Catholicism. The Pope said it again twice. James White corrected himself on the dividing line and still insulted us at the same time. Well, they might have been right, but they should have been more cautious. All right. Here, that was the first disagreement with James White. I don't find anything necessary to apologize for. Let's go to the next one. So this this one is a Hank Hanegraaff um, going Eastern Orthodox. This was in I 2017. Don't think, I don't believe I wrote this article. I think this was Jeff Maples, although I could be wrong. I know it says news division. It was on Jeff, it. and this is where James White said we used a atomic bomb or bazooka. bazooka. Or something like that. And he's going to go through it in one and a half speed with a scalpel. Right. So he said that we used a bazooka because we we just said straight up in the headline that Hank Hanegraaff left the Christian faith. By the way, when you become an Eastern Orthodox, you leave the Christian faith. Rich Pierce got on the dividing line. No, or, excuse me. It was on the phone with me. And he said, how do you know he didn't become a, a, a Eastern Orthodox because his wife wanted him to? At which point I said, I don't care. What I don't care. Mean? What what difference does that make? And Rich Pierce told a long story about how uh, James had saved someone out of Mormonism, but he, he got broke. He went broke. He had to become a Mormon again to get financial assistance from his family. And he's like, see, you don't know somebody's heart. And that's the first time that James White accused me of, quote, judging from afar. So it doesn't make it any better that you deny Christ for money. All right. Now that was the first article, the second article that James White took exception with when we, he called it the bazooka article show the next, the, the, the next article that, that comes up, David. So, so, so the next one here is a YouTube video of Hank Hanegraaff tra- explaining his conversion right. to Eastern and Orthodoxy. We don't, we don't have to play that video, but what I pointed out at the time is, it, and, and this was also James's argument. Maybe he doesn't know what Eastern Orthodoxy is, and he's just attracted to the smells and the bells. This is the Bible answer man. That's the Bible answer man. Furthermore, as a polemicist, I'm well aware what it takes to become Eastern Orthodox. It is much harder than to become a Roman Catholic, much harder than to become a Roman Catholic. The process of chrismation is so complicated, you have to know your doctrine. And this is a YouTube video of Hank Hanegraaff defending the doctrine of Eastern Orthodoxy. Again, James White came out and said, well, they might have been right, but they they came to their conclusion awfully fast. We came to our conclusion, and it was right, using logical deduction and basic knowledge as to what Eastern Orthodoxy is. Let's move on to the third one. I have a question about that one real quick. David, yeah, go ahead. Did James White correct you before this Hanegraaff video, or was this available? Because Hank Hanegraaff, basically, in this, he he pretty very accurately and and thoroughly defends Eastern Orthodox. He defends you know theosis, defends their definition of. We did um, an article as did, soon as we saw that Hank Hanegraaff. It was announced. I don't know if it was a press release or whatever. We had it out very quickly. And White was like, well, we, we don't know for sure that he believes in Eastern Orthodoxy just because he became Eastern Orthodox. And there were a lot of there and, were a lot of uh, Christian ministers who took that approach. Like, well, I don't know. It's like, well, I don't know. Maybe. And maybe it, it was you know, there was an article on his website because he controlled uh, the, that ministry of Walter Martin. 
after Walter Martin died. And that ministry had an article about how Eastern Orthodoxy was heretical. It was, and kingdom, you could download it. It was until kingdom, he removed it. It was Kingdom of the Cults, and and they removed the article. So let's go to the third set. So so this is uh, Brian Houston of Hillsong acknowledging. Uh, the ministry of a gay couple at Hillsong, New York City on video back in 2014. So we broke the story. There are a couple of homosexuals leading a choir at Hillsong, New York in particular. Now, there are all kinds of other controversies in relation to Carl Lentz, uh, his appearance on Oprah, his uh, refusal to call abortion a sin, his refusal to call homosexuality a sin. And then, of course, we know in the last year what happened to Carl Lentz. He was a horror monger, lady chaser, all that. Um, but uh, we did a video, we did a, a series of, of articles exposing gay choir directors at Hillsong, New York. Now, here's the thing: these were reality TV stars who were on the show as gay men. Like, how could they not know? The Broadway Michael boyfriend. Brown, what? They were called the Broadway Boyfriends. That was their name. Thank you for the reminder. They were called the Broadway Boyfriends. And um, yet, Michael Brown came out and defended them and said, oh, you don't know that, they, that he knew they were gay. It's a big church. Maybe he didn't know that, right? I mean, it gets even crazier. The Broadway Boyfriends then find themselves at Hillsong LA and say, of course he knew. The Boyfriends, the gay guys are saying, of course Carl knew that we were gay, right? James White has a phone call with Carl Lentz and says that our article has some inaccuracies in it. What are the inaccuracies? I don't know. I don't remember. I'm not saying I didn't know at the time. I don't know, but I don't remember at the moment. There's some inaccuracies. Why you're taking the word of Carl Lentz over us, I have no idea, but I suspect it's because you were wrong about the Pope. James White, you were wrong about Hank Hanegraaff. It's embarrassing to be wrong. You got an ego the size of a, of a Mack truck. And so now you're going to take the, si the side of Carl Lentz over pulpit and pen. The article that David just put up was the smoking gun article in which we found the footage of Bill Houston. Is it Bill Houston? Houston. Brian, Brian Houston. Brian Houston of Hillsong, Australia, the mothership on American television admitting that they had gay choir directors on national television before years before the story broke by pulpit and pen. James White still defended him. Why? Because of a phone call. He had a phone call. The phone call cleared it up. Not exactly discernment. So it's about this point in time. I'm saying, listen, listen to James White for new Testament textual criticism. Listen to him on, you know, some, I don't know, whatever else boring crap he talks about. But when it comes to discernment, he needs to stay in his wheelhouse. I don't do New Testament textual criticism, not my wheelhouse. I don't do Islam for the same reason James White shouldn't do Islam. It's clearly not in his wheelhouse. All right. Stick to what's in your wheelhouse. Talk about what you know, not what you don't know. It was embarrassing that he took the side of Carl Lentz. History has judged between us. What do I have to repent for again? All right, let's keep going. So, so next one, we got a, a video of a Judge Not Conference in 2017, August 2017. Now, you'll notice that I never criticized James White over the Yazir Kadi thing because Brandon House was going after him and Justin and Mike and Jesse Johnson and Susan Heck and all of Brandon's podcasters, Brandon was going after them ruthlessly. I had already left Worldview Weekend by then because I saw some character issues with Brandon that I didn't like. He still had broadcasters like Justin and Mike and Susan. He was going after James White, literally anathematizing him to hell because James White had a interfaith dialogue with Yazir Qadi, who he claimed was a moderate Muslim. James White let Yazir Qadi engage in dawah. He let him play the fool. He became the fool. And the flyers for the event advertised fellowship. 
It is a loaded theological word. My position, unlike Brandon Howe's, was not James is a turncoat. James is a secret Muslim. James is, is doing this deviously. James thinks he's the smartest person in the room at any given time. He thinks he cannot be outsmarted by professional Islamic apologists and that he had this handled and he was made a fool of. I didn't say a word about it until this video. Can you play that, please, David? I think I gave a timestamp. And so by the way, you'll see Mike. Hold on a second. You'll see Mike Abendroth. Is... You'll see Mike Abendroth, Phil Johnson, Justin Peters, me, Andrew Rappaport, and then Tim Hurd. Go ahead. Sitting down with a leader or representative of some other faith, some other religion. I'm going to be real nervous about that because he has a track record. And this is, by the way, this is this is Jordan answering that question about concerns this is Justin. about inter. Yeah, this is Justin. Let, he's he's about to finish, yeah. and then you're about to start answering about uh, interfaith dialogue. By the way, Justin's answer was was identical to mine, and it was the it was identical to Phil's, and we all agreed on the stage. Uh, but I'll, I'll let myself speak for myself in the video. If one of the doctorly sound guys does that, I may not agree with the venue or the setting or whatever. Uh, or, or even the, the uh, doing it in the first place, but I'm going to have a bit more confidence in someone who has a solid track record uh, of. I'm going to fast forward just a little. There we go. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. What do my elders want me to do right now? Let's stop here for a second. Um, stop. Let's stop. Just for a second. My elders wrote an agreement with James White, that we would not address one another or argue in public anymore because we're both 1689 Baptists. We don't need to bring that type of drama into the church. We both signed the agreement. James White had Rich Pierce attack me within 24 hours. So that's why I said, I'm thinking about what I want my elders, what my elders want me to do right now. James White did when so when people commenters say, why do you guys you guys both need to make up? We had an agreement. My elders were in on it. James White broke his word. That's why. Play the clip. Yeah, interfaith dialogue, we would have to be more specific. Let me say this. I've spoken to every individual on this stage on the phone, I think about this issue, maybe not Andrew, but I've spoken to him in person about it. I don't know anyone on the stage that is quote unquote for interfaith dialogue as it is commonly explained through, and in, in, instead of being passive aggressive, I'll just say Brandon Howes or Worldview Weekend because we know who we're talking about. We're not for the caricature that has been presented. Um, Listen, I, I have problems with what happened. Um, the flyer, as best I understand it, said something about uh, fellowship. That's untenable biblically. That word is a loaded theological word, and probably whoever put that flyer together didn't understand the significance of the word fellowship. But I can put that in the stupid category, if not in the sinful category. Um, Furthermore, if I was going to come together and discuss agreements with an imam, I can answer that real quickly with scripture by a question. What agreement does the house of God have with the temple of idols? So uh, I, I'm sure that there's another way of talking about it in terms of, you know, we're monotheists and et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, um, there's, there's not agreement on those issues in the same way that if I was talking to the Roman to a Roman Catholic priest, and he said, we have a lot of things in common. I would say, we have nothing in common. Nothing. Because at the end of the day, we have two different eternities if you don't repent of idolatry. And so that being the case, um, that that's how I feel. But here's the thing. You should be able to disagree with someone without anathematizing them to hell. All right? Now, I know you're thinking... I just watched JD this week anathematize like 50 people to hell. <laughs> 52. 52. 
in one sermon. <laughs> but I, I want to explain what Justin means because what will happen is people are live tweeting this right now and they're going to be pulling video from this and saying that Justin gives a defense for Rick Warren or wouldn't defend Rick Warren, sorry, that'll be on a blog. <laughs> that Justin wouldn't give a pass to Rick Warren, but he would to James White. Here's the thing, though. Uh, when we deal with someone who has an honorable track record of ministry, as does James White, it doesn't mean that what they do is right. It means that good brothers sometimes can be in error. And Paul rebuked Peter to his face and still recognized him as a brother in Christ. We have to grow up. We, we really do. Here's something that has concerned me, though, on the other side. Then I'll be done, I promise. When you defend an action, such as that interfaith dialogue, I would encourage people to defend it from your interpretation of Second John, perhaps, or, or other verses that do it expositionally. I have been disheartened by seeing good Calvinist or Reformed brethren defend what happened as though they were Arminians. By that I mean excusing behavior or actions because someone meant well and because the purpose was sharing the gospel. That's how Arminians and that's how seeker-friendly types, that's how purpose-driven people defend stripper poles in the church and shooting midgets out of cannons. Because any dumb thing they want to do, they say, I'm just doing it to reach people. I'm just doing it to share the gospel. I mean well. Defend what happened based on the merits. And then if I disagree with you, okay, we'll move on. I don't think that, that you're selling your soul to Islam. You're not defending Islam. Anything. I don't think anything like that happened whatsoever. It's just let's not defend things because of people's motives. And let's not defend things because the purpose of, of evangelism uh, or the purpose of, of an event was evangelism. Remember this. God has not only given us the mission in Scripture. God has given us the methodology to employ. He's not only glorified in the end, God is glorified in the means. Now, I have had people attack me over and over again saying, you attacked James White just like Sam Shamoon, just like Brandon House. David, did that sound anything like a hardcore criticism like you've heard from Sam Shamoon or Brandon House? No. <laughs> that was at a Q&A. That was the only thing I had to say about the whole affair I thought I gave a fair opinion of both sides. I don't like the fellowship thing. I don't like the dialogue thing. Even this, the uh, an American security uh, intelligence um, organization came out and said, beware, radical Muslims are using interfaith dialogues for their own purposes. I think it was foolish. Yazir Qadi it w was far more radical, hanging out with Linda Sarsour than what James White knew. He was foolish, but I was not willing to cast him out to hell with Brandon House. And by the way, I was the one that called up Jesse Johnson and I forget whoever else. I was the one who talked his other broadcasters into leaving his program, leaving the, the Worldview Weekend Broadcasting Network over his treatment of James White. I did that. Call Jesse Johnson and ask him. I did that. That's how he wound up with Jeff the GK. Sorry, I brought Jeff the GK on the world because Brandon had to replace Jesse Johnson and Justin Peters and Mike Abendroth. I did that in defense of James White. But my criticism was fair. But one thing you learn about James White is you criticize him at all, he's done with you and you're his mortal enemy. And by the way, I wanted to bring on Robert Trulove but I, I never touched base with him. The fact is, James White has a history of treating Christian brothers far worse than Islamic extremists. Go, let's go to the next clip. I said we'd be pithy and quick. So this is an article in Christian News, uh, christiannews.net uh, from back in 2016 for the uh, uh, tattoos uh, and booze. Um, the group raising money by uh, tattooing people and sampling beer. Okay, so um, how I got involved in this, this was not my article. This was Michael Markavage at christiannews.net. By the way, great website. You should check it out sometime. And Heather Clark is one of the best Christian writers that there is. She's very good. 
um, he wrote about the fundraisers at Apologia, fundraisers, plural, in which they were selling tattoos and selling booze in part, along with other things, in order to raise money for a church plant in, in Hawaii. Those are the facts. Um, I would not have ran Michael Markavage's article. I just ran it over at Pulpit and Pen with attribution. I got permission from Michael because I don't like Apologia Church. Never have. And we'll let Seth explain why in a second. I would not have ran Michael's article had I known that the man getting a tattoo in the photo was James White's son-in-law. I had enough respect for James White to not touch his son-in-law. I didn't know it was his son-in-law. I didn't know his daughter went there. I had no idea. James became instantly defensive. You're a fundamentalist. You're a legalist. And I'm going, whoa, I'm not even saying tattoos are sinful. I'm saying, however, there is a theology of the body. And a theology of the body might lead us to believe that we shouldn't alter our body in a way that Christ Jesus is going to undo in our glorified body. When these bodies come out of the ground, I don't think you're going to have your tattoos. So it should be thought about. And booze, I'm not a teetotaler. There was a, I'm not a teetotaler, meaning that I don't believe that, that drinking is a sin. I've never taught that. I asked my church one time, how many of them drink alcohol? 99%. The only ones who don't drink alcohol are those who have struggled with alcoholism. However, we don't have drinking at church events because we have brothers who have struggled with alcohol. So my only point at the time was this is unwise and stupid. And I love Doug Wilson. I think he's one, I think he's the best Christian writer on the planet. And when he does his booze and Psalms thing, I think that's dumb too. And I can say on one hand, I love Doug Wilson, but his federal vision thing was dangerously close to heresy. I'm glad that he's pulled back and I don't like the booze thing. Do I not have a right to say that? But instead, James White brought his brought Durbin on. They spent about two hours calling me a liar for t- just telling you the truth. Their main claim is that it wasn't a fundraiser. It was multiple fundraisers. Well, I'm just quoting my, Mark Cavage's. Okay. Now, now we're arguing semantics, but this was their argument. You ready? Here's the lie. Here's the lie. These weren't fundraisers. You, these weren't booze and tattoo fundraisers. I'm not kidding. This, listen to their episode. I, like, I beg you, listen to the episode. These were not booze and tattoo fundraisers. We were only raising funds for a church plant by selling booze and tattoos. That was their argument. All I did was report the truth of what happened there. Now, let's show the next article. Here's where it really went south with James White. What does that say, David? Uh, apology to church from booze and tattoos, how the story ended. Okay. How the story ended is, and my argument was, it's just unwise to associate alcohol with church because a lot of people are getting saved alcohol out of alcoholism. And Durbin explained that Apologia was funded, or excuse me, it was founded out of uh, a, a, a addiction rescue group. And he assured us that Apologia Church was a perfectly safe place for former addicts and alcoholics. Okay. Within a few weeks of this article, Thad Pinch, Dr. White's son-in-law, went into rehab for alcoholism. He fell off the wagon. Turned out he had fallen off for some time. He was a part of the booze fundraiser at Apologia. Like he took part in all that, although abstained there, he was still watching and taking part here in his heart and committed adultery on James's daughter. James White's first tattoo was the Cairo, and it was to match his son-in-law's tattoo, the Cairo. I would not even have addressed it had I known. But I don't take things down. I don't like cancel culture. My tweets to Braxton Canner are still up somewhere. I'll, I, I would prefer I just keep it up and you beat me with it. Then Apologia counseled Summer White, Jaeger, pinch, whatever, to divorce her husband. And Thad Pinch's father came out, not to me, but to Michael Markavich, a different publication, and blamed James White, blamed Apologia, 
also blamed his son. He didn't pull guilt from his son, but he said, this was not a positive recovery environment for my son. And he would not have fallen back into this sin if it wasn't for this type of behavior and this type of immaturity in the church. So if you want to complain about booze and tattoos, I never said it was sinful. I said it was stupid. It was unwise. I think that time has judged betwixt us. Next one. This is James White on the topic of Rosaria Butterfield. Yeah, this is a fun one. This one was written by Diane Gaskins, actually. Rosaria was using um, uh, uh, preferred pronouns. You can understand the problem with preferred pronouns. James White said that was not true, that she was not using preferred pronouns. Why? You want to, you want to know why? Because he called her on the phone and she, she said, said she that wasn't. she didn't. Yeah, she <laughs> said so on the phone. Next article. It's like the Karen Swallow Pryor uh, method. Next article. And I think there is one out of order and it might be this one that I sent you in Telegram. This is James White, Rosario Butterfield and Secret Changing of Minds. So she, Rosaria Butterfield had written like in writing that she uses preferred pronouns, but she assured James White so that he could go tell his audience that J.D. Hall was a liar, that she does not use preferred pronouns and that we made it up. All right. Is there a third one there that was out of order? Uh, let's see. The next one I have is. Butterfield quietly edits audio referencing her stance on preferred pronouns. Yeah. Butterfield canterized her own words coming out of her mouth, saying that we should use preferred pronouns for the sake of hospitality. Now, let me ask you, if I accurately quoted Butterfield and she changed her position but didn't make it public, and all I have access to is what she said publicly, is it fair for James White to call me a liar for quoting her words and not being omniscient and being able to read her mind? No. Well, and, is that fair? No. And this, this is very consistent. I mean, we, those of us have, have read her stuff know this is consistent with her, you know, universal hospitality kind of idea anyway. Yeah. That, well, there's no weird. reason. Yeah, in other words, there's no reason you should have thought it was anything other like, than what it was. It's, it's like when Tom Buck was defending Karen Swallow prior saying she's not an animal rights activist. She's an animal welfare activist. Yeah. Okay. What, what, whatever. Or, well, you know, um, and Michael Brown does this a lot where it's like, no, I talked to Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson says that Bethel doesn't engage in grave sucking. And we're like, here's a video of him doing like them doing grave sucking. Like this is Bill Johnson's wife grave sucking. Well, I talked to him on the phone. He says, nothing. that's the opposite of discernment. It's not just listen to what people do. It's look what they're, look what they're doing with their hands while they're talking. What's the next one? So, so next one here. This is a this is a podcast. Um, it looks like a James White podcast. Jamar Tisby woke ideology and Jeff Riddle's shocking statements. We'll make this one real quick. I I listened to this as I was helping to uh, restart a church on the other side of the state, and somebody was like, "Do you know James White's talking about you right now?" Nope. And in the podcast, uh, he was talking about something we had written about Jamar Tisby and Albert Moeller. This, what, what's the date on this? This is uh, October 13, 2020. <laughs> 2020. Yeah, less than a year ago. <laughs> um, basically claiming just because Jamar Tisby is teaching critical race theory doesn't mean that he understands what he's teaching. So it's unfair to call him a critical race theorist. <laughs> and just because Albert Moeller has this taught in his seminary doesn't mean that he's a critical race theorist, even though he's promoting Jamar Tisby. I don't think I even responded to that one. I don't think I even responded. At that point, I was just like, okay, I give up. This guy just wants to disagree with everything that I have to say. This is why I was upset when Michael O'Fallon gave credit to James White for fighting this fight from the beginning. That was in 2020. Who wants to argue that Tisby is not a critical race theorist now? It was, it was anybody, obvious, but it was obvious in October of 2020. Anybody paying attention? You, we can't judge the Pope by his words. We can't judge Hanegraaff by his confession of faith. We can't judge Tisby by his words. We can't judge Rosaria by her words. 
<laughs> and every time he can't just say like I did, you know what? I love JD. He has some good stuff. I don't agree with everything that he does, but I'm not willing to anathematize him. This is a man who's gone to his audience repeatedly and is like, don't listen to pulpit and pen. They're liars and they're slanders. Listen, I'm sorry it went down with your son-in-law the way it did. I'm sorry he cheated on your daughter. I'm sorry that you were so embarrassed over what happened with the booze and tattoos thing and that it happened so quickly. I didn't mean for that personal insult to ever happen. I, like, I, I feel bad about it, but I'm not going to apologize for the truth. I'm not. I'm just not. What's, what's up next? So this is an episode of Polemics Report from September 2019 with you discussing this issue, uh, I believe. Oh, I guess I did. I responded via podcast. Yeah. So, so for any listeners that, uh, or any watchers of this video who want to go back and check that out, this is September 16th. That's right. 2019. In the podcast, he said that I should be ashamed of myself for calling Jamar to be a critical race theorist. Yeah. So this is a, this is kind of out of order because this podcast, you're responding to his criticisms back in 2019. And still we have over here in 2020, um, I'm assuming, and I haven't listened to this podcast, but I'm assuming this is him still not. That might be the, that might be the, 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 the yeah, but that's okay. I mean, if, that might could be the wrong one, but listen, listen to the podcast I did. I would have been referencing the podcast he did in which he was upset that I was taking, not that I was taking Jamar Tisby's words out of context, but that I didn't have an omniscience into Jamar Tisby's heart. And maybe he was using the language of CRT without actually being CRT. What's the, what's the next one? So next is uh, Jeff Durbin's secret recordings and apologia church. I believe this Seth, is all you brother, Tim, this wasn't my article. This was Seth's. So go for it, Seth. Okay. Give me just a little time to set up apologia church and Jeff Durbin for you. So before I wrote this article and this article is about Jeff Durbin recording penitent sinners and then using those recordings later to his advantage. By the way, he did not tell them he was recording them. So you can deal with the ethics of that on your own. I tried to talk to Jeff Durbin. I texted him to say, hey, can I talk to you about these accusations before I write the article? He refused to talk to me unless it could be in the presence of the elders of my local church. And as I, I don't know if the newspaper calls you, if the Arizona newspaper calls you, Jeff, does, do you have to, do you have to get their church elders? They, they, they might not even be Christians. So he, he has to put it in like his court because he knows I'm not going to do this. And I didn't fine. You're not going to talk to me. I emailed James White, who was coming to Atlanta. He was going to be in the G3 conference that year. And I was going to be at the airport at the same time he was going to be at the airport because the G3 conference is near the airport. And I said, James, come to dinner with me. Let's talk about this. I know you're the scholar in residence at, at Apologia Church. Now, you know, I, before I wrote this article, I attempted to talk to James White. He would not meet with me. So Jeff Durbin would not meet with me under reasonable circumstances or talk to me. James White would not meet with me in person before I wrote this article. So here's the article. Here, here's what happens. Tim Hurd was criticizing uh, Jeff Durbin's ev uh, evangelism technique. So Jeff Durbin is one of these people who films himself evangelizing people and then puts it on YouTube for other people to watch, and then they can donate money to him. So that's, that's a revenue stream for him. Watch me, watch me evangelize somebody. Hey, watch this. And Tim was criticizing Jeff Durbin's methodology. And I, I don't remember the critic, the critique, because I, I didn't I didn't even listen to it, quite frankly, but it was something along the lines of Jeff took, you know, Jeff went down this 30 minute presuppositional thing before he shared the gospel. He should have shared the gospel faster. So that was Tim's criticism Which, on the To, be, to be fair, I think my 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 thought at the time was I, I didn't care. Yeah, I, I mean you who cares? I mean, I, I'm glad he's out there evangelizing somebody. I'm not gonna, you know. Go out there and evangelize people. You know, right. somebody's evangelizing. That was that was never say. that was never our issue. Yeah, not our issue at all. And Tim may have been drafting on him. So what you see a lot in in the the internet Christian world is what I call drafting. Like in, in NASCAR, when the car gets up behind somebody and they both go the same speed. In, in Christian world, if you write a negative article about somebody big time, like a John McCarthy or a James White, you're drafting because, oh, 
oh, you're talking about James White. Now I'm going to read your thing. Now I'm going to listen to your program. So in fairness, Tim could have been drafted Jeff Durbin. All right. And all of a sudden this video comes out on YouTube and it's a recording of Tim Hurd talking to Jeff Durbin and apologizing to him for some other critique that he'd done in the past. So Tim had critiqued uh, Jeff Durbin in a different way in the past. And he said, you know what? I was wrong. So he called and apologized to Jeff, Dur Jeff Durbin said, you know, forgive me. I'm sorry. Unbeknownst to Tim, Jeff Durbin taped that conversation. And then after, yeah. And then after Tim did this critique on Jeff Durbin, you know, taking too long to get to the gospel, an anonymous YouTube video came out of Tim apologizing to Jeff. And then the gist of it was like, look at Tim Hurd, this wicked guy. He had, he had apologized to Jeff Durbin already. He apologized and, once, and that was and taken as yeah. he, sh he can never yeah. criticize me again. Yeah. And, and again, this the video did not come out on the Apology, Apologia Studios page at first. And that's a very popular page, very popular right. so YouTube this site. Is, if I remember this because this is right when I was first started to work with you guys. It, it was an, an anonymous YouTube channel, right? Like a new one put up just for the purpose of mm -hmm. doxing Tim Hurd with this secret recording, right? Yeah. So Tim clutches his pearls. He's upset and does a podcast about it. Well... When he said that that Jeff Durbin did this to me, it didn't take long for other people to start saying, hey, Jeff Durbin did this to me. It's like, oh, Bill Cosby slipped you a Quaalude? Oh, he, he slipped me a Quaalude too. So Je I, I talked to several people, three distinct people in the story if you read it. So if you read the story at Pulpit and Pen, I changed the people's names for their privacy. So one person was a church member who uh, his daughter and Jeff Durbin's daughter, and the article is very sanitized, very sanitized because of the ages of the girls and uh, what happened in between them. There was some inappropriate sexual things going on. And this, this, this guy who was a member of Durbin's church went to uh, try to work it out with Jeff Durbin. Well, Durbin and his wife acted like it was all, you know, not their daughter's fault, it was all the other daughter's fault. So the, the Durbins have four children. This is publicly known information. Imogene, Sage, Sailor, and Stellar. And I think they have an adopted baby too. And it was one of these four kids that, that were teenagers at the time. And they just made it like the, the little girl, she was like 12 or 13 years old, uh, of the other family was this sexual predator, this aggressor. And they even called one of her, like this music program she was in, you know, where you learn the fiddle or something. The fiddle, they the tried to get her kicked out of an extracurricular yeah. activity. And they did. The, the girl was kicked out. And it just so happens that that particular father has his daughter's text messages go to his iPad. And, and he had evidence that, yes, it was Jeff Durbin's daughter sending these sexually suggestive things to her and with, with and it said dar which is teen speak for delete after reading like hey look at this uh lascivious text but delete after reading and then that guy had that evidence and you know he, he was able to show that hey my daughter wasn't a predator in this situation it was your daughter jeff durbin who was the instigator of this but before all that happened you know he was apologizing can i stop for a second yeah go ahead so far i mean god is saddened by this right but who cares? I mean, I wish he hadn't have uh, uh, attacked this guy for what his daughter did. But yeah. things happen between teenagers, even homosexual things. That's not this. Let, let's just be clear. Yeah. That's not the right. story. That's not the story. That's not now, the somebody. Story. Yeah. If somebody wants to go and say, well, that's his household. He has to have children who believe they can go there. But yeah. I'm, all I'm saying is that Jeff Durbin is really unfair to this guy. And this guy apologized to Durbin. Like, hey, I'm sorry this happened. You know what? Durbin recorded it and then used it for leverage later. Like, I, I, hey, you're on video saying you're sorry. There was another guy. Uh, so at let, me, let me stop you there, too. One of the highest privileges that is to be invoked and used in, in, in terms of clergy is what's called clergy penitent privilege. I have invoked it in courts. I have invoked it with the ATF. I have invoked, invoked it with family services. Sometimes I choose not to invoke it. But clergy penitent privilege says what I talk about 
and with the penitent. If someone is confessing a sin, that's between me and them. I don't have, I'm not sharing that with other people. What Jeff Durbin did in taking this man's confession of, it wasn't a confession of sin or private communication, yeah. recording it without his knowledge, and then using it later should be an automatic revocation of his ordination credentials. What ordination? What credentials? Before I go on to the story, let me let me, let me just let me bring this up. That Jeff Durbin is a, a karate man. That's his job. He's been in karate movies. He's been in dojos. I, I've spoken with Jeff Durbin's father. Jeff Durbin's father no, is, is out. He's out of their life because Jeff Durbin has a restraining order against his father. And I've spoken to his father and you can tell when you're talking to an old man who's heartbroken over not being able to see his grandkids and, and that's it. And there, there's some degree of separation because a Jeff, Jeff's mom is a, is a Roman Catholic. The dad is nominally Roman Catholic, but Jeff's father told me this, that Jeff Durbin started two dojos, which failed. So two failed businesses. Uh, Jeff, he, he told me that Jeff went to Bible college, but he couldn't get up on time to go to the classes and he flunked out. So if anybody knows if Jeff Durbin has any formal Bible college or seminary training, let me know. Because for all I know, Jeff Durbin flunked out of Bible college and couldn't get up early enough and had done some like youth minister stuff. I, I talked to, and I talked to Jeff that. Durbin's I talked to Jeff Durbin's dad for two hours. His dad and his mom. They were both on the phone. And it was pretty shocking stuff. Um, and at the end of that, uh, I had told them that I couldn't receive any of those accusations. Um, I didn't feel as though I could receive those accusations and to go speak to his fellow elder about it. Then I texted Jeff and said, here's what's, ha here's what just happened with your dad. And I hope that you can heal the relationship with your dad. Yeah. We chose not to use that information at pulpit and pen. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to say, Oh, you're just out to get Jeff Durbin. Uh, not even close. Yeah, we have worse things. People say we're this, you know, we're slander, rag, a, a gossip, the national. You should Enquirer. see the stuff no, we know that we you don't should see print. the stuff that we don't print. All right. But what I can tell you, I talked to the guy's dad and Jeff Durbin's the kind of guy who sleeps at one o'clock and misses class. All right. That's that's the impression I get from his dad. So you talk about Jeff Durbin, Durbin having an ordination. OK, we take ecclesiology and the doctrine of the church very seriously at pulpit and pen, as should your local church. Now, we, we've talked about how Apologia Church was birthed out of a drug ministry. Now, here's the thing. Jeff Durbin was the chaplain of a program that did addiction recovery. And at this particular, particular addiction recovery center, uh, you can Google the name of it if you find it. You know, you can go, I want the secular recovery route or I want the spiritual recovery route. If you click spiritual, you know, you, you get a chaplain. Now, I have no idea how he got chaplaincy credentials without a formal education because you're supposed to be had to have a, a master's and be endorsed by somebody to be able to be a chaplain. At least that's how it is for the Army. So he was the quote-unquote pastor, the pastor of this addiction recovery center. Listen, 10 or 11 drug addicts in an addiction recovery does not constitute a church where they have deacons and elders and a church. That's a temporary situation. Let me, let me play host for a second and fast forward just a little bit. And correct me if I'm wrong, Seth, but what you have found, though, and what was in the article is that this wasn't the only case. There are multiple times. That yeah, Jeff there are Durbin multiple cases. Talk about that real yeah. quick. I'm going to, but I, I have to set up that this is a, a the Jeff Durbin's church is a business that he founded. All right, is not planted by another church. It's Jeff Durbin. He's the Greg Locke of the West, in my opinion. All right. So going back to the recordings, because you're talking about this is really unprofessional behavior from a pastor. Yeah, he's not a trained pastor. He's some dude in America who started a church. Okay. So you've got a second dude. All right. Now this particular guy. He's from New York. He moved out to Arizona, and he started attending Jeff Durbin's church. He, he's a self-proclaimed Durbinite. Now, he had teenage daughters who were friends with, with the Durbin's family, and he took issue with the kind of like television program, like sexually explicit television programming that the Durbin kids were allowed to watch. Riverdale came up. I don't watch the CW and the Riverdale, but apparently it's a very salacious show, and that, that's par for the course TV watching at the Durbin household. And he had the same kind of situation uh, with his daughter and Durbin's daughter, 
and what he called teenage cattiness or a similar situation that the first guy had. And I'm, I'm being careful not to use their names. And the same thing happened. Durbin met with them to try and resolve it and recorded them. Now, unbeknownst uh, to this gentleman, his daughter made a surreptitious recording himself. And when Jeff Durbin released his recordings, they had selectively edited stuff out, but there would have been no way to prove it unless his daughter had been recording. Now, that, that guy wasn't a church member. He was just an attendant. So not only is he recording conversations privately yeah. and secretly to use them against the penitent later, mm-hmm. he's releasing edited yeah. footage right. to release now, later. Jeff Maples is going to kill me for this because he hates Mike Cosper. But I've been listening to the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast uh, that's come out recently. It's on Christianity Today, Christianity Astray, and Mike Cosper's the host. And it's just about the, the toxic leadership environment of YRR Mark Driscoll, who, like Jeff Durbin, was not, you know, he wasn't ordained and planted from some other church. He's just a guy who founded his own church, and it was about him. So you would think about what, why are these members doing this? What happens? Call Apology a church and ask if members can vote. If it's a congregationally ruled church who can vote, ask them that. Or ask them if the elders just okay. decide everything. I forgot right? some of that, but that is why I'm glad that I had you on. I don't think that it's fair to say that Jeff hates anyone. But I think it is fair to say Jeff, so far as I know, just thinks that Mike Cosper reminds him too much of Rachel Maddow. Uh, okay. if members, <laughs> members are- all right. uh, which uh, Jeff I, Maples, not Jeff Durbin. Yes. I don't know how yeah, Jeff sorry. Durbin feels yeah. about Mike Cosper. Yeah. Jeff Maples um, sure doesn't like that dude. Yeah. Well, I, I, neither, neither do I. And he also reminds yeah. me of Rachel Maddow, but I think Jeff is the one who said it. I'll give him credit for that. So uh, this particular so, guy wasn't, his family were not members yet, but this, they were regular. Attendees. This marks the last time that James White ever responded to us. He did not. I don't think he ever responded to this. Well, he, this did he? He wouldn't meet with me, and I don't know if he no, ever I mean, did. After the, article, hour. after the article came out, no. Nope. What are you going to say? That's indefensible. Okay. And I've only talked so about at, the it's two at, guys. It's at this, this is not point. The worst of it. It's at it's at this point that after Seth's article comes out, and we don't we just don't want to beat the drum too much, Seth. And I thank you for joining us on the program. Um, after this article comes out, there's no defending recording your church members' penitence and then using it against them later. None, none. That's disqualifying. And trying to keep them out of other churches, like calling other churches where these people are going and say, you don't let them join your church. They're not. There's a four letter word for that. What is it? A C-U-L-T, that's, cult. There might be an cult. interesting podcast you can listen to. It's called Cultish, and it's from Jeff Durbin's Apology and Ministries. So I think that's hilarious that he has cultish. It is clearly a cult behavior. It and acts he, like a cult. When James White went to PRBC, people asked why. And I said, I, I have, I have a guess. And my guess is they don't worship the ground he walks on at PRBC. You mean when he left PRBC, when he left PRBC, yeah. when he went to apologia, he's, he's, he's a hero. And he's and got he, his, again, it's not a sin, but he's got his two arm tattoo sleeves. That's in. I would like apologia. to point people to an episode of Vice um, called Hate Thy Neighbor, um, and um, in which the OSA organization run by Rusty Wallace. Hold on, is that a NAS- NASCAR driver? Did that I is a NASCAR driver. Rusty Thomas, who lost his kid not too long ago. We should still be praying for his bereavement. That's a sad deal. Rusty Thomas was reviewed on this vice land episode by the way i've said previously i think vice does some excellent journalism oh yeah they have good stuff they have good stuff um they there's not very many people doing real investigative journalism vice is pretty good now they're liberal as all day long yeah but they're they do good stuff gotta bleep the f word they did an episode in which they looked at anti-abortion ministries too rusty thomas's and jeff durbin's And after it was over, the conclusion they came to was Rusty Thomas is the real deal. He really believes this stuff. And Jeff Durbin is a self-promoting cult leader who doesn't care less about it. And all he is in it for is the fame and the money. And the trips to Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii is a very unchurched place, but let me tell you, so is the American Southwest. Not just Phoenix, but the very impoverished, poor Indian reservations. 
Uh, but but that's my that, that's that's my assumption. But when so when someone says you you have repenting to do, I don't have repenting to do. This is what Seth has produced is stone cold. There's there's evidence right there. This is a cult. Four, this is a four stories. Four. This is a dang cult. And so when somebody you need to repent for what you've said of Jeff Durbin, Jeff Durbin needs to address what's been said, not just to me, but to dozens of former church members who have said the same thing. It's all a cult. People know, all people know of Jeff Durbin are the people who see his videos and say, wow, that guy is smart. Just yeah. like people would listen to Mark Driscoll and say, well, wow, he, he's spot on. And he raised hundreds of thousands of yeah. dollars for, for babies are murdered here, not babies are murdered here, but uh, to stop abortion now. And the End first thing – and what he did with that money was build a studio for himself to put on a late night comedy show. Yeah. This week tonight by Jeff Durbin. Like he's, he's a comedy host. Let me, let me tell you guys something. Like, you, guys, this Jeff Durbin. You, you guys can't see winner. this on, on the podcast, but you can see it on YouTube. This is a, this is my Hebrew Bible. Bibli- you can see it. Bibli- Biblia Hebraica Stuttgart Gentia. All right. <laughs> Look, it's Hebrew. I can't read it. If I read this, I need, I need two lexicons and five hours to, to translate Genesis one, Michael Brown, James White's friend, on the other hand, could just read it to you. He's got a PhD in, in the near Eastern languages. All right. Smart guy being smart and knowing a lot. Does not mean you have any discernment and it doesn't mean you're a good Christian? All right. James smart and uh, James White is super smart and knows a lot. Does he have discernment? Look who he hangs out with. All right. Jeff Durbin sounds erudite on his YouTube videos where he controls the editing. All right. But what do you really know about him when you say, oh, you, he's solid. He's 1689. No, he's some guy we're, who found we're his own business church. We're going to have to move on and feel free to, feel free to chime in. What, were there other articles in that, David? So now, now we're getting to the times that you have specifically come to James White's defense you know, for, Let's for just those. go through those real quick. So if somebody says, all you've done is attack James White, it's right. like I've done like two articles critical of MacArthur too about Romans 13 and Shepcon and like and a, like like a million articles defending them. Same thing goes for James White. Just, just let's just run through those real quick. We mm-hmm. don't even, we don't even have to discuss so them. Eric Mason slanders James White as a racist with an out of context video. That's the defense of James White. Yes. And we Next had, one, and that was in uh, 2019. Then we have uh, this is this is uh, posting James White talking about the SBC and the ERLC, um, promoting ba- his work. Yeah, basically promoting what he said is it, in agreement. Uh, this is James White on the Southern Baptist Convention, Paige Patterson, and egalitarianism uh, from the same year. Again, um, saying hey, what he said was was legit, promoting it. This is uh, sharing a uh, YouTube video, linking YouTube video where uh, James White is going up against Steve Gaines in Radio Free Geneva back from 2013 and and saying this is a fantastic episode of Radio Free Geneva where James White reviews a recent sermon by Dr. Steve Gaines. For every article that you can find critical of James White, you can find one that's positive of James White. Mm-hmm. This is and, a- and, Go ahead. Uh, Justin Peters there... Uh, you read it. I yeah, can't see the it. Video from Justin angle. Peters responds to slander and libel by Brandon Howes. This is the same time. This was over the Yazer Cotty thing. So James White plays into this article. And the whole point is that I was defending Justin for not anathematizing James White. Yep. So when people say, all you've done is attack James White. I defended him as much as possible, as much as reasonable, as much as reasonably possible. And this one is, this and, f- and, and too, Sorry, it, it, it warms my heart when I hear people say, what did JD lie about? And they, they, it doesn't matter. It's just like, well, James said he lied. James said he's a liar. James, James says he's a slander. And that upsets me more than anything, which why oh, I'm wasting my time with this tonight. Here's why that's so upsetting. James White was instrumental in my early ministry in teaching me how to think and not to emote. And I wish that some of his fans would pick up on that too. Let's call it a day on James White and say, we'll pick on his pampering of Michael Brown some other time. But one day James White will treat his reformed brethren like Robert Trulove as nicely as he treats some nar heretic like Michael Brown. Maybe one day. This segment is for James White's fans. Hope you enjoy it. 
If you're a patron, keep listening. We'll be right back with you. We are the news source that will tell you the truth, no matter what. We are the ones who haunt the dreams of big tech gatekeepers who throttle free speech. We are the ones who have survived boycotts, blacklists, embargoes, and truth blockades. We are the ones who are still protesting. We are Protestia. Check us out online at protestia.com. 